Welcome to Physiological Psychology, where body and brain meet mind and behavior. In this screencast, we're going to cover topics that are also discussed in the introduction chapter of your textbook. Be sure to read that as well. Also, turn up the volume on your device if you're having trouble hearing me, and make sure that you activate closed captions for a better understanding of the video in general. What is physiological psychology or biological psychology? We're definitely going to answer that question for you. How did biopsych begin? It didn't always exist as a discipline, so we're going to look at how it emerged in a historical context. And finally, we're going to talk about animal research, without which biopsychology or any biological sciences really would have a hard time doing what they do. We owe much to our little furry friends. Those are the topics for this screencast. What is physiological psychology? Um, it is uh, a neuroscience, as we will come to understand. And it goes by many different names, as you've, as you've probably noticed. Physiological psychology, biopsychology, psychobiology, behavioral neuroscience, it was called when I took it in college. So it goes by many different names, and there are several, uh, several approaches to it, as well as related fields that can be a little bit confusing, where, but we're going to disentangle right now. So biopsychology is nothing more than the scientific study of the biology of behavior. Within that, we, as we have said, it is a neuroscience because neuroscience itself concerns itself with the study of the nervous system, so the brain and the nerves throughout our body. Biopsych certainly does that as well and goes beyond that as we will see. So it is a neuroscience and it combines the fields of biology and physiology. So it has an emphasis on the evolutionary, developmental, as well as physiological mechanisms of behavior and experience. Uh, but it goes beyond that, as I mentioned, to also include the endocrine system. So this re refers to hormones. And as we know, hormones definitely impact the way we think, feel, and act. So it brings in the field of biology and it combines it with the field of psychology, which concerns itself with the study of the mind and behavior. So that is biopsych. There are many fields that are related to biopsychology. As we've mentioned, it is a neuroscience because it does study the nervous system as well as any biological processes that impact the mind and behavior. Um, neuroscience is mainly a research field. Uh, you're going to see that many of these are divided into fields that uh, channel you into in research, so you become, an, you investigate uh, mental processes and biological processes, and usually uh, you would be required to have a PhD for a research field like neuroscience. Some of these other fields require only a master's or a more uh, applied degree, like for example, medicine or counseling. So for example, um, neuropsychology is an interesting uh, branch of psychology that deals with the diagnosis and treatment of uh, essentially brain injuries. Um, they also um, look at developmental disorders like autism, uh, spectrum disorder and ADHD as well. So not just brain injuries, but often that is the case. So for example, say somebody who suffers a concussion from uh, mountain biking or a uh, football game or so, and they're concerned about the impact this concussion had on their memory or cognitive faculties in general, they would go to a neuropsychologist uh, who usually has at least a master's degree and who would give them a battery of tests to assess uh, their mental functioning essentially as a result of this injury or developmental disorder. Neurology on the other hand is a different field that uh, requires that you go to medical school so it is a branch of medicine and uh, here 
a neurologist specializes in the study of the nervous system, so this particular part of the body. Not just the brain, but anything related to the nervous system. So, for example, you could go see a neurologist for your sciatica, or a pinched nerve that is causing pain throughout your lower limbs, for example. Uh, finally, we have psychopharmacology, which is um, another branch of psychology uh, that concerns itself mainly with the effects of various substances on uh, moods, behaviors, uh, sensations, thinking, etc. So basically the impact of drugs and other substances on how we think, feel, and act. So biopsych is clearly related to all of these fields, but also distinct from it. I invite you to take a second and try to take a shot at this application exercise that I usually give students in class. I suggest that you pause the video at this time, try it on your own, and then come back and see the answer so you get the most out of it. So let's match the related field of psychopharmacology to its approach. That would be 1B, what is the psychoactive effect of increasing the amount of the neurotransmitter serotonin. Two, Neuropsychology would be D, three, neurology would be A, and four, C. So where did biopsychology come from? As I mentioned, it didn't always exist, even though people have been thinking about the mind and behavior and the brain for time immemorial, really. I will say that the approach in this class is mostly a Western approach. Uh, Eastern thinkers and philosophers have been uh, considering these issues for as long as the Westerners have or longer, but our approach here um, is mainly a Western one. So we start with the Greeks, as many uh, of the natural inquiries do in the natural sciences. Uh, all natural sciences used to be once housed under the umbrella of philosophy that investigated all natural phenomena, including those of the mind and the body. So we start with Aristotle um, at about 300 BC, who was uh, inquiring about where the seat of intellect was. Where did thinking and rational processes take place? Well, he didn't think it was in the brain. He thought it was in the heart, hence expressions like learning by heart. So what did the brain do for Aristotle? Well, the brain was merely a cooling unit for hot blood. Yeah, like a fridge. Uh, fast forward a little bit to 100 BC, and we're in Rome now, Italy, with the physician and philosopher Galen. He made a little bit of progress. He did ascribe the seat of intellect to the brain, as well as these liquids flowing throughout our bodies, or what he called humors, that gave us uh, personality traits or uh, moods like, say, anger or uh, uh, peacefulness or a contemplative state, etc. Uh, really fast forward through the Middle Ages where nothing much happened, mostly due to a ban on human anatomical dissections by the church. Um, and then we arrive more or less at the Renaissance with the French uh, mathematician and philosopher René Descartes. If you know anything about Descartes, you know that he was a dualist, meaning that he proposed that the body and mind or soul were made up of completely different substances. We have a material body that you can touch and feel versus an immaterial soul that is out there, it's ethereal. Descartes had to solve this problem of having the mind and body be separate and yet the mind or the soul influencing the body. How do I make my muscles move when I want to if they're made of different substances. So he made them connect through this special place in the brain uh, called the pineal gland, special for him. And he proposed that the body was made um, of basically water pipes. Uh, it was like a hydraulic system where fluids flowed through the nerves and made the muscles move, uh, which is, um, you know, getting close to uh, what we think today, but in a slightly different way. Um, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, so we can always look back and think, oh, what strange idea. Um, fast forward a little bit more to the uh, late uh, 18th century, and here, um, um, 
we have um, Luigi Galvani, who was a, 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 an Italian physician. He proposed the idea of animal electricity or bioelectricity. Uh, essentially, he did these. He conducted these really bizarre experiments that, fun fact, actually inspired Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, uh, where he hooked up a dead frog's leg to a metal wire to a hook during a thunderstorm with lots of lightning, meaning electrical discharge, which then made the frog leg twitch. And he then proposed that we all animals have this intrinsic electro electrical force that is responsible for muscle contractions, this life force, if you will. Um, his uh, rival at the time, Alessandro Volta, actually ha held an opposing view in that uh, electricity is found in humans, yes, but it's not intrinsic to them. It is found all around us in the universe, but more akin to the concept of chi in uh, Eastern philosophy and medicine, if you will. So Alessandro Volta actually built the first battery, hence volts, to disprove Galvani, which he did successfully. Nevertheless, Galvani laid the foundations for modern electrophysiology and neuroscience with his ideas. So we're making progress here in the field of biopsych, which wasn't quite named that yet. Finally, we arrive at more modern day thinking with uh, the, the figure in history who's considered the father of modern neuroscience, and that is Santiago Ramon y Cajal with his neuron doctrine. He was a Spanish histologist who drew and investigated nerve cells. And in this case, in this doctrine, he suggested that unlike many other people thought, including his opponent, uh, Camilo Golgi, the nervous system is made up of individual discrete cells called neurons that don't quite touch each other. There's a gap in between or the synaptic cleft, synaptic gap. Um, his opponent, Camilo Golgi, actually suggested that the nervous system is one continuous mass of tissue that is not made up of individual cells. Ironically, Ramon y Cajal used a stain invented by Camilo Golgi, a silver chromate one that darkened neurons and hence allowed him to see that they were indeed discrete cells. So we call that the neuron doctrine. Uh, interestingly, they share the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine in 1906. Finally, I want to touch uh, on a topic that is very important as well as highly controversial, which is that of animal research. Uh, when we talk uh, about animal research, uh, we must uh, specify that there are many reasons why humans conduct research on animals. They are often very similar to us and yet less complex and thus uh, easier to study. They're also much less expensive to house, feed, and use in general. And finally, of course, they provide um, benefits uh, to not only humans, but to animals as well. If you ever took your pet uh, to the vet or gave him some medicine, as well as, of course, the ethical considerations in doing research on humans. So there are various reasons for doing animal research. Uh, however, this uh, topic tends to divide people into mainly two camps, that of what we call the minimalists, who uh, are in favor of firm regulation on research, uh, even though they do favor research, um, with the goal of minimizing the amount of stress and pain induced uh, on animals. And uh, for this, there are usually what we call AYA cooks or institutional animal care and use committees that are made up of veterinarians, um, community members, researchers, in any university or, say, pharmaceutical company that conducts research and makes sure that uh, regulations are followed. The other camp, of course, is that of the abolitionists who are against any and all animal research. They maintain that animals have the same rights as humans, and therefore any use of animals in research is unethical. They invoke the concept of speciesism, which is essentially that uh, humans uh, believe that they hold a privileged position in creation, which is not the case, according to them, and therefore they feel that they can exploit animals, which according to them, again, they shouldn't. 
So uh, this concludes our screencast. Make sure that you look at these objectives and that you're able to do them at the end of this mini lecture. See you next time.